so uh, simple and elegant Rails code with functional style is the name of this talk. Um, I've been working professionally for uh, three years now. I spent um, eight years in the .NET space. Just a little bit of a feedback. Can you help us with that? Thank you. Can you guys hear me? Cool. So I spent uh, uh, eight years in the .NET space, and I, I was lucky and fortunate to switch over to uh, Ruby uh, and Ruby on Rails. Um, I was laid off to, uh, two months ago from my previous job, and I found a new job in Chicago. So I'm moving from Northeast Ohio to, uh, to Chicago. Anybody? Are we cool? OK. Anybody here from Chicago? All right, see you guys there, hopefully soon. Um, this is the company I work for. I am the uh, only developer right now. We are looking for other people. Um, we are really big in the franchise space, uh, and we make, um, um, we actually give um, numeric results uh, for hiring decisions. So instead of uh, just making a, um, instead of a gut feel, you basically have a numerical results, and you can pick your best candidates based on that. I'm not going to um, teach you functional programming uh, in this talk, and I'm not going to uh, try to bend uh, Ruby to be a functional one either. Hopefully, I'm going to uh, show you uh, some simple and elegant Rails code. Um, at my previous job, I shouldn't move, right? All right, I, I won't, I promise you. Uh, so at my previous job, I had a 25 minutes commute. Um, to work, and I listened to the radio, but I got sick and tired of the, of the commercials, and I decided to uh, listen to audio books. And the book, E-Myth Revisited, was recommended to me by a friend of mine, and I remember the moment when I heard that sentence. The work you do is a reflection of who you are. You know, when I see somebody does a crappy job, I, I don't think about the job he does, I, I kind of think about what kind of person he is, or she is. Um, if we can translate it to our own profession, uh, the kind of code you write, uh, it's, it, it describes what kind of person you are. Two weeks ago, I went bowling with my son, and I drove through um, this road. And I thought, uh, I'm going to lose my, one of the wheels on my car. I, st I stepped out, and you see the car is passing right there, but I took a photo. Uh, I think it took more than one or two years to uh, end up a road like this. And you can see that they try to, try to fix it, but how successful that is, right? I call this uh, road refactored. <laughs> you know, they, <laughs> They put the tar in it, you know, and, it, and it's good probably for like a winter or half the winter, and then uh, spring comes, and, and this fix is going to be um, pretty much as big or maybe bigger. Uh, this pothole is going to be bigger uh, than what it was before. Uh, late last year, I went through the, uh, the news, and uh, I, I found this story from, from China. Uh, the person refused to sell his, uh, his apartment, and uh, the government just couldn't wait to build a highway. So what they did, actually, they built a highway around it. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, two weeks later, I think they agreed on some kind of price and they, they finished the highway properly, but still. So I think this is an awesome story, and I thought nothing could, nothing could top this, but I was wrong. I, I actually, uh, a couple of weeks later, I found this. Uh, a family refused to re move the remains of the relatives, and uh, they had to build uh, this building. They put down the foundation. Well, they couldn't wait. You know, they just started to do it around the gravesite. Here's another angle. Do you remember what your room looked like when you were 15 years old? You know, mine looked probably something like this. I spent, uh, I spent probably hours looking for my textbook, my jeans, or whatnot. Um, yeah, this is, this, is what I, this is what it looked like when I grew up. And I'm not proud of it, but that's what it is. <clears throat> so let me show you this puppy here. Um, this, uh, this is a model from um, one of the Rails apps that I had, I had the privilege of, uh, to work on. This is actually an e-commerce application. This is the orders model. 2,700 lines of code. I'm not kidding. Uh, the, the calculate shipping method in it, it's, uh, I, unfortunately, I don't have my notes. It's on my cell phone. Uh, but the calculate shipping method is, is somewhere around 206 lines of code. Uh, and right below it, there's actually a recalculate shipping method, 197 lines of code, untested. Yep. So we tried to tackle it. Uh, we looked at it and like, just screw that. It's just, it's just too much, too big of a work. Uh, when you see code like this, think about companies actually that has code like something like this. 
I was laid off from this company because of financial reasons. This code actually can bring down a company. Think about it that way. That way. And, it, and I, I would like to give them the excuse that actually this code was written by contractors. No, actually it was written by em employees before I got there. So I wanted to find a tool, a good tool that uh, I could use uh, to analyze code complexity, and I bumped into the flog jam. Does anybody know the flog jam here? Awesome. Um, I talked to actually Jim Weirich at a, at a different conference um, early January, and he said, hey, I use actually flog to run it against a project that I haven't seen. I don't even have to crack open the classes. It just gives me a value, and based on that, I can tell how big of a mess or how clean the code is. Uh, so the, uh, the way it works is that you run it against a class or a group of classes, and you're gonna, get, you're gonna get a number. And what you need to know about the number is that the higher the score, uh, the more pain the code is in, or I could say uh, the, higher the higher the number, the harder to test it, okay? This is really uh, central in my, in my talk, so uh, please uh, check it out. Uh, e installing it is super simple. You, you have to edit to your gem file. I usually edit in my Rails app. I edit to uh, development or the test group and um, you can install it through uh, RubyGems. Um, running it is super simple. Uh, it's going to uh, give you an, a numeric results. You can run it against one class or a group of classes. What I usually do, I just run it against uh, controllers and, uh, and uh, models, and 95% I, I, I can tell uh, what kind of code I'm looking at. So uh, the video that you saw uh, earlier in, a, in, a, in, a, in the previous slide, it has 25,902 flock point. Imagine that. So just, just so you can, you can, you can the, the number hopefully that I'm gonna show you here is gonna have some kind of sense to you, or it's gonna make sense. Um, the ideas that I'm gonna talk about here um, were born um, through work, working on different uh, Rails applications. Uh, in order to kind of retell the story, I wanted to come up with a, a one application, and this is a tracking application where you can provide the category, the amount, and description. It's key that it's not just a simple save, you know, just get the value and save it in the database. It has to do some kind of parsing logic, right? So when you provide running 3.2 went well, it's going to save it into a, a category table uh, with the value of running, and then the track um, amount, and the JSON data basically with the amount and, and the kind of description around it. Uh, it's gonna file the track uh, with, that, with, the, with today's date. If you wanna override that, uh, that date, you can actually use um, you can actually use the, uh, the, the date prepended to your input. Let me ask you a question. Um, where do you put your domain logic? Do you put it in controller? Raise your hand, please, if you, if you put it in your controller. Come on, guys. <laughs> How about models? Where do, you, do you put domain logic in the models? Okay. So that's like one third of the room. How about you guys? How, how about the two third of the room? Where do you guys put domain logic? Okay, all right. <laughs> yes, yes. So uh, I, I thought actually this is history, but the, the code base I inherited from contractors uh, or consultants, actually I don't, I don't call them consultants, I call them contractors. Uh, the code base I inherited from, uh, from uh, contractors at Hierology, uh, it's controller heavy. So. Uh, 1,750 lines of code actually in a controller is not uncommon. Yes. Oh, and the, by the way, <laughs> I, uh, when I was interviewing, I asked the contractor, hey, uh, how many unit tests do you have? You can guess the number, right? Zero. I'm sorry? I, I did because the, um, yeah, good point. I did join them because the business idea is great and I think they have a future. Yeah, we just have to clean up that, uh, clean up that application and I'm, I, I hope I can come back and tell you guys the story, how, what we did about that. Um, so basically, uh, what I tried to do is I tried to uh, code this uh, parsing logic into the controller action, and this is what, pretty much what the code base I'm working right now looks like. Um, I don't want you to spend and understand basically what it does. Um, it basically just has the stamp on it, right? <laughs> There's 48 lines of code, uh, really bad. This is how the flag looks, the flag values uh, actually are, tr are trending. Uh, this is our initial state. I'm comparing black is the controller, in case you, can see it, you cannot see it, and green is the model, right? The controller has a higher value because it does the parsing, right? The, the model has some additional logic, but, but not all that much. All right, so what I did, I used um, our uh, favorite refactoring pattern, 
extract method. Instead of using uh, comments, I used um, uh, method names to describe that particular routine, what it does. I went from 48 lines to 25 lines. And um, yep, this is actually uh, how I ended up with the refactoring. And this is what the flock values are after this refactoring exercise. Uh, flock total went up slightly. Uh, you can see it's 71, and it was around 65-ish. However, the method with highest flog in the controller dropped down to health, right? So instead of looking at that huge action, you know, with like 40-something um, flog value, 46 point, it's now 20.6, just by uh, using extract method. A pretty good sign. And uh, this, is, uh, this is where we went, right? We figured out that uh, reusing logic from the controller is not all that easy. So what we did, we uh, went from fat controller to fat models. Um, I tried to follow this trend as well. I moved the parsing logic from the controller action, put it into uh, the model. And you can see now that the controller looks pretty nice, pretty clean. You know, instead of doing the logic itself, I'm, I'm actually doing the parsing in the model and I'm just sending the message to the, to the model. And look, Look how we, we are trending here. The, the model went up to 84. Uh, and, the, and then the controller actually dropped down to uh, 25.6. Pretty clean. You know, I, I can tell you that uh, uh, a class with 20, 30 flock points, you can, you can pretty much grasp and understand what it does. And all this thing back, you know, that, that example that I showed you, that was 2,500, right? 2,500 points. And this is where I joined the party. Um, three years ago when I, uh, when I started working on the Rails application that I, uh, that I had the pleasure to work on, it was a, by that time it was a four-year-old four year app. And uh, when I joined the company, I asked the fellow developers, uh, how many unit tests do you guys have? Well, we have zero, that's why we hired you. We wanted you to help us with that. And it's, it's cool, and why, why don't you guys running it? And the, the answer I got was is that it takes forever to run it. It was 17 seconds actually on that code base to run one spec. So imagine doing a TDD by that. So what I decided to do early on is move my business logic out into services, and uh, I had a blog post out there on it. It got uh, quite a bit of uh, um, hits, um, and I was, uh, I was stubbing actually a whole lot of stuff out of Rails that I don't do anymore, but uh, with these techniques, I was able to go and run ex execute actually specs uh, under one second. It was a totally different feeling. All right, so uh, the, the code really doesn't change all that much after this change. Instead of calling the, the, the model, I'm calling the service. And the service itself is a Poro object. It doesn't inherit from any kind of active record or action controller or anything, anything Rails related, so I can easily test it as just like a pure, plain old Ruby object. Do you guys, do you guys actually write services this way? Using Poros, raise your hand if you if you write those. Sweet. All right, so uh, I'm switching actually gears here with my um, uh, the the graph that I'm using actually to represent the flag values. Instead of comparing the, the controller and the model, now I'm actually comparing model to services because that's where I'm shifting the code. You can see that the total uh, for the model went back to 38.4, uh, where it was before, and the. Uh, and the, and the service actually is around 71 point. And I'm using only one service class, so that's why you see that the flock total actually and the flock class average are the same. This is how I wrote service classes at the beginning. I had an entry method. In this case, actually, it's four track. Um, that that uh, red, reddish kind of um, circle represents the controller, and that's the service. Uh, the for track is my entry method. It calls other methods on the service itself, and by the end of the call chain, I have an instantiated track object available. And uh, this was beautiful because I was uh, testing actually all the methods. I made all the methods private. I killed many unicorns. I, I'm proud of it. Uh, but basically, what happened was is that uh, this was one object, and when I changed the signature, let's say the builds category for the builds category method went from two arguments to three arguments, all of a sudden my unit test started breaking. I'm like, why? I mean, this shouldn't. Of course, because I was testing uh, private, supposedly private methods, I made them public just, to, just so it's easier to test. So I changed it back. I'm gonna, I used actually a one public method on the service class, uh, four track, everything else was uh, private. 
And um, I was able to change now the, the, the signature of the method. However, uh, setting up the tests were really, really hard. Just because that service object was violating single responsibility principle, and it was really hard for me to test those. And the question comes, uh, what do you do when uh, um, your uh, business customer or, or your customer comes back to you with additional requirements? Where are you gonna put that code? How are you going to grow this service, right? Are you gonna add another method? Are you gonna increase the, uh, the effort that it takes actually to run one single test? Yep, just think about that. I was sitting at this coffee shop um, a year and a half ago in January helping a, a, a coworker actually with a problem. And um, we, we coded a service this way and it took me, I remember 10 minutes trying to understand why I cannot run a, a spec, why a spec is failing, what is the dependency there? It was obvious that the specs are telling me something and I wasn't listening. Before I continue the story, I'll take a look at how I named my service. Instead of using objects, physical objects, like user or employee or door or car, I'm using actually verbs. They define action. And uh, I, what, I've, what I learned is that I can follow single responsibility by naming my services this way. So when I call a service parses feed, I know exactly what it's gonna do. I know it's not gonna save a category into the database table. I know it's, gonna send, it's not going to send an email to the customer or anything like that. It's going to do one and only one thing called uh, Parses feed. It's just going to parse that feed that I'm, I'm, I'm passing to it. I attended Code Retreat um, pretty much at the same time when I was sitting at that coffee shop and somebody recommended reading this blog post. Please do yourself a favor and, and read this. This is actually written by a Java developer. It's called uh, Execution in the Kingdom of Nouns. Uh, read that blog post and you're not gonna name your, uh, your, um, your object the same way or your services the same way. So as complexity grew, um, I saw that my methods actually grew from five lines of code to eight lines to 10 lines of code. Instead of doing that, what I did, I created subclasses. Uh, as I went and I, I created subclasses for all these methods that I, I refactored early on um, and used the extract method for, what I gained with that is that it was so much easier to test it because all I had to do is just stop and mock the dependencies. I didn't have to go and set up all the requirements that it needed. What I, what I cared about is that they were called in order. Uh, so I was, it was a whole lot uh, happier experience, but still I didn't feel it wasn't perfect. What I was striving for actually was this. I really wanted to have a code that looks like something like this. I wanted a uniform interface. I wanted a, I wanted a method actually with context uh, uh, as an argument to uh, add it to it. And uh, the reason I wanted to do that is because it was super simple to test this, right? I did, it was only one argument that it had to take in. It was only the, the context method that I had to stub out. So this is what I was striving for. As I mentioned, I spent eight years in the Java and .NET space and I learned uh, design patterns or tried to learn design patterns quite well. Which design pattern is this? There you go, chain of responsibility. I loved, I loved this design pattern. The reason I loved it is because uh, whatever I had to do in my work, it was, uh, I had, it was not only one thing that I had to do, it was like five things, just like in this case. You know, I received the arguments, I had to split it, I had to sparse it, I had to check if data was passed in front of it, I had to validate it, I had to save it in the database. Every kind of test that I do has at least six steps, five or six steps to it. Um, and I, and I, I believe actually the chain of responsibility is a pretty good solution for it. I tried to build chain of responsibility in Ruby, but it was just too heavy. It just, it just took too much effort. I think chain of responsibility makes a lot of sense in Java, you know, in the statically typed languages, but, uh, but in Ruby, it was just an overkill. So as I, as, as I went through this exercise and I showed you what I was tri striving for, uh, two types of ob objects emerged. One was actually the organizer object that you see here in, in blue, and uh, little actions that I'm gonna talk about later. So the, the role of the organizer object is uh, telling you a story. So when you look at an organizer object, you can, you can pretty much figure out what that particular process does. In, in my case, it starts with uh, splitting the feed to parts, uh, parts, sorry, parses the record it at, validates feed, so on and so forth. And when you put code around it, you could still read it. You see, that's what's so beautiful about this. You can still read it out. You don't have to kind of hunt down what it really does. It has step one, step two, step three, step four, so on and so forth. 
So the organizer object tells you the story. That's what it does, nothing else. It doesn't execute business logic or anything like that. It just tells you the story. However, the actions, the actions are the, the atomic building blocks of, uh, of this process, or um, series of actions, I call them. Uh, and what they do is uh, one action represents one business logic right in there. Um, the actions are called uh, in order. Uh, they are called by the, um, by, the, uh, by the organizer object, and data is passed into it through the context. So let's look at one of these actions. One of these actions. This is what my class looks like. You see it has a, an execute method that takes a context in. It has a guard condition. It pulls the data out it has to work on. It runs the business logic, puts the, shoves the, the, the data in, uh, back into it, and at the very end it returns the context. So after I, I refactored that large service class with multiple, multiple private methods, this is what I ended up with. Look at how my uh, flock class average for the service actually dropped down from somewhere around 70 to 13.9. Uh, I can tell you, you can understand a, 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 a class actually with, with a flock value of 13.9 very easily. It's just super simple to understand. You could ask me, what is so functional about this? Well, uh, I'm not maintaining state. All my actions are stateless. And uh, uh, functions are wrapped in a class object. I could have used module, but I, uh, to be honest with you, sometimes I do use actually a little bit of uh, uh, private class. I'm sorry, private method. And, uh, and uh, that's, that's pretty much it. You know, it, it, it cannot be simpler than that. The context itself is like a conveyor belt in assembly line. It's um, just like the, the way uh, cars are being built. Goes uh, from one station to the other. There are workers adding stuff to it. They're altering things on it. That's exactly how the context works. And uh, the object actually has a well-defined structure. Yep. The context actually, you can see that it's instantiated by the organizer object. And um, they are being used actually to pull the data out, just like I, I used the analogy with the uh, assembly line. And um, they are pushing, they are pushing uh, the context into a failure state. Because I need a signal if something failed, I don't want the third and the fourth step, for example, to execute. So in this um, slide I'm describing that, the first action passed, the second one failed. And then the third and the fourth did not even execute. As I was going from one job to the other and one project to the other, uh, I ended up copying files. And uh, referring back to David's keynote, uh, necessity actually brought me almost to a framework or some kind of gem. And that gem is called Light Service. Uh, I didn't sit down and, and just write, you know, light, write service. I extracted it out. And uh, it's very simple. And the reason I call it Light Service is because it has only two classes in it. And I'm proud of it, and I don't want to make it more complex than that. I want to give people the freedom to do any, any, any way they want, want, want to use it. Uh, the organizer object has its uh, own structure, uh, feeds the data, um, builds the, the data actually uh, with the, in the form of context, uh, iterates over the actions, uh, calls the execute method on it, and then injects in the context into it, and return the, returns the context at the very end. Um, the action itself has um, an execute method, returns the context. If there's a failure there, it does the guard condition, extract the data out of it. This is where you put your business logic, basically. And at the very end, you return the context. So uh, a, friend of mine, a friend of mine who was working with me at the time uh, asked me, you know, it's really annoying that I have to remember the guard condition and the execute method at the very end. Sure, very good uh, observation. What we decided to do, instead of uh, using and, and make, you know, you have to remember that you have to edit the car, uh, add the car condition. Instead of doing that, what we did, we actually created a macro. So you don't have to remember to add the guard condition and return the execute uh, at the very end. Executed is going to give you actually the execute method. And then the block is going to be called whatever you, you pass in there. Yep, hopefully it's so much um, uh, easier to use. You can go ahead and, uh, and take a look at it, install it through RubyGems, or uh, download it yourself uh, and clone it. Um, the question comes, though, is 
what happens when you have to grow software? You see, every project starts out so beautiful. The first two months, everything just flies so fast, right? And two years later, it's like one tiny change that, would, that should take half an hour takes three days, right? So the question is, how are you going to grow your software? I think that's, that's, that's a crucial uh, question here. In order to uh, kind of see how I could progress to a, a, um, a model that, that has 27 lines of uh, code in it, uh, I decided to make an a, experiment. What I did, I actually had the controller action uh, with, you know, with, uh, with the extracted method in it. And I'm comparing the services with the organizer and the actions. So that's what you see. Left-hand side is the controller with the, with, with the parsing logic in it. And then on the right-hand side with the uh, red color, you can see the series of actions right there. And this is our initial state. Uh, the, the complexity uh, on the right-hand side for flag, flag class average is 71. And the, the actions are at 14 points. All right, what I did actually, I, since we are talking about growing software, right? What I did, I duplicated the methods. So, and, and I uh, uh, appended um, one uh, to the very end of the method names. So I had not only parses feed, but I had parses feed one, parses feed, and, and you, you get the picture. Uh, and I did the same thing for the classes. I just duplicated the classes as it is. You know? So instead of having six actions, I had now 12. And these are the numbers I had. Uh, it went to 124.2 uh, for, the, for the controller, because I had only one controller, right? Uh, and the method, I'm sorry, the flog class average was around 13 still. And I tripled it. And this is what happened. You see how it, it starts growing? And I believe if, if, I, if, I, if I'd done it long enough, I would have probably ended up with a flag value of 27 or, or 2,500. But the key, key point here is that the flag, flag class average is at 13 point. So this is the trend that I noticed. Uh, if you keep go growing your software just in one class, you know, adding, even if you had multiple methods in it, it's going to be O-N, you know? And, uh, and, and the uh, class average, uh, flag class average is going to be around 13 or 14 if you keep and stick to that style. Word of warning, um, when would you use this? A friend of mine asked, so would you do actually a series of actions with light service all the time? Uh, no, actually I wouldn't. If the complexity or the business logic doesn't require it, I wouldn't do it. I would actually take advantage of Rails. I would use it for that, and I don't do it. You know, I mean, wherever I have update attributes and it works, perfect, just do it. But as soon as I have a conditional, maybe I keep it in the controller. As when I have the second conditional, or maybe a conditional and an iterator, I'll break it out into a service, and if that service actually is doing more than one thing, I'm breaking it in, up into two actions and one uh, organizer object. So that's the principle that I've been following in the last couple of months. And this is how I show you that. Take advantage of update attributes. If the case is simple, please use, please use Rails. It's pretty good, at, pretty good at that. What if you haven't worked on this code for, let's say, six months, and, uh, and the, the customer comes back that, hey, um, the way we initialized the, the, the category, I want to do something else there as well. What do you do? Well, since I'm not using uh, observers, I'm not using uh, concerns, um, basically what I have to do is just look at um, either, either the routes or just execute the action, figure out which action and controller I have to go into. I find the controller, and in the controller I see that, okay, the, the logic is not coded there. Actually, it's externalized into a service. Very good, I follow that and I easily follow the service. I go into the Rails independent service and I notice that the logic is not there, it's an organizer object from a series of patterns, a series of actions, sorry, and I look at since it's really easy to read, I look at the actions and I find actually that the category is the fourth action. I open up that action and from the 13 lines of, or 15 lines of code, I can easily find the line where the category is being initialized. Super simple actually to find the code. I remember actually uh, pairing with a developer uh, at a shop in Chicago and they had a build failure. And we stared at the code for an hour trying to find why we couldn't initialize an object through a factory. How's it going? The other uh, advantage that I, I found was actually code reuse. This was about a month ago. I had to uh, work on um, uh, uh, one of our interview guides. When we load it, we have to go through a series uh, of different tasks, and I uh, put it in into this code. This is actually from our production system. You can see how I built a, an organizer object with uh, seven different um, actions. 
And admins actually can edit the same questions. They can delete questions. In order to load it for edit in the admin section, I was able to reuse four out of those seven actions easily. Huge reuse. All I had to do was just create a new organizer object, and I was on my way. Beautiful. Code reuse. And that's what I ended up with. And unit testing it, I didn't have to unit test you know, the actions. I was able to unit test just the organizer object. Boom, done. And I also found out that I'm not alone with this kind of, th this kind of thinking. Uh, I paired with a developer at HashRocket in Chicago, and they were using actually strategies. They didn't have a gem or didn't have a, a best practice for this, you know, but I noticed that they are actually weaving actions together here in this particular code. So my summary, um, get out of the framework. That's what I try to do all the time and put my business logic outside of Rails so I can unit test it really fast and I can reuse it. Any way I want, I can move it from Rails to a background worker. Anywhere I want, I can put in a gem if I want to. Uh, the code should tell the story. You, you look at it and you should re it should read it like a paragraph in a book. Um, don't use state if you don't have to. I think it gives you complexity and it's just going to make your code more complex. That's what I found. Uh, separate behavior from the data. My data is actually the model in the context and that goes and flows through uh, the commands or actions. And uh, grow your code horizontally. Instead of uh, adding another method to a class, uh, to a model or a controller, create a new class, please. Just grow horizontally. What do you do when you have a change? You encapsulate that change actually in, in a new class. And most of it all, make it simple. So when you remember, um, this is actually uh, 2,500 lines of code that I try to represent with this messy room. I'd like you to think about this hotel room in Japan. This is actually a hotel room without a TV, without a furniture or anything like that. Look at the simplicity of this hotel room. So when you see actually an action like this, I want you to imagine that hotel room without any access, any access furniture, anything, anything, anything unneeded. Here are my social links. I'm going to have it up there in a moment. Thank you for your attention. I actually, you can find uh, the slides. It's an older version, but you can find it actually through this uh, link if you want to write that down. It's bit.ly ad at railsconf. I constructed that link this morning. And thank you for your attention. <laughs>